All right, guys, I wanted to start off another video. This time we're going to move into alkanes and talk about, um, really, they're not very reactive. And so we won't talk about their reactivity until much later in the course. But we do want to start to get a handle on how we represent alkanes uh, from a geometric perspective. And, we wanna, and really what we want to do is we want to introduce alkane naming. And so this video is going to be specifically geared on alkane naming. And then at the end of the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce um, Newman projections and how to draw Newman projections. Then from Newman projections in later videos, we'll talk about potential energy surfaces and rotations of Newman projections. And we'll move into cycloalkanes from that point. So let's get into alkanes right now and let's talk a little bit about how we're going to name them. In a second, what I'm going to illustrate to you is that and alkanes are fairly simple when you're talking about one, two, three carbons, and even four carbons to some extent is fairly simple. But at the end of the day, once you start to get five, six, seven, and so on and so forth, more carbons in the molecule than just four, then the possible arrangements of those carbon atoms becomes essentially numerous. And while it's it's easy to say that we're gonna have a name for something that's got one or two or three carbons. But once we start moving beyond that, we need more than just these simple names. We can't use common names, really. We can't, we can't name them Joe and Mary and Sally and Bill and, and, and Sue, because at the end of the day, there's just millions and millions of possible arrangements. And we have to have some systematic way of naming them. And so what this video really is going to be focused on in the first part is naming those alkanes from a systematic perspective. And so let's get into it. All right, so if I were to talk about one carbon, then I really can't even draw a skeletal structure of that. I have to draw a Lewis structure. There really aren't, this is, this is only one carbon. And then if I get into an expanded number of carbons, let's start talking about two carbons. Again, I can draw a skeletal structure, but the skeletal structure is just a line with two points on either end representing the carbons. Again, there's not, there's not any, un, any different ways I can arrange two carbons. And it turns out the same is true with three carbons. I can only arrange the three carbons in a row. But once I get to four carbons, it turns out that I have different ways to arrange them. I could arrange four carbons all in a row. And again, I want to make sure that I understand the formula C4 H10. Or I could arrange the carbons like this. It's still four carbons. And in fact, it still has the formula C4 H10. In a second, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about the systematic way to name compounds. And at the, at the heart of that naming will be a count of the number of carbons. Specifically, it's going to be a count of the number of carbons in, in what we'll identify as, a long, as the longest chain. But for simplistic, simplicity's sake right now, let's just talk about how many carbons there are in the molecule total. I can call this thing methane. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about those prefixes in a second. I can call this ethane, and I can call this propane. Again, the prefixes will tell me about how many carbons there are in the molecule. Ethane. 
But at the end of the day, the next one, propane, when I have four, it's butane. But which butane am I talking about? And in fact, based on our systematic name, that's not even butane. That's a different type of propane. But in other words, if I have four carbons, which of the four carbon isomers am I talking about? Now, these are constitutional isomers. Notice they have the same formula, C4H10. The number of carbons and the number of hydrogens are identical in each of the different structures, but what makes it a constitutional isomer is that it has a different connectivity, a different, connect, different connections between the atoms. So, at the end of the day, what we're gonna need is we're gonna need a systematic way to name these molecules. Because what if I get into something that's even more complex? What if I get into something like this? What's the name of this molecule and how do I deal with that? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna end up teaching you how to do that. Uh, and we're gonna carry along this systematic naming method not only for the rest of organic chemistry one, but also for organic chemistry two as well. So let's jump in and let's see how this works. Okay. So the first thing that I wanna start with is I wanna start with, what are these prefixes? The prefixes tell the reader how many carbons you're referring to. And we're gonna go up to 12, because at the end of the day, there's gonna be more of these. If you take a look, uh, this is the IUPAC method of naming the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. This is a particular set of rules. And if you take a look, there's, there's rules for, you know, for naming numbers of carbons that are beyond 12, 13, 14, 15, so on and so forth. But in this course, I'm gonna expect that you know 12 up to this particular point. So again, this is meth is one carbon, eth is two carbons, prop is three carbons, bute is four carbons, pent is five carbons, hex is six carbons, hept is seven carbons, oct is eight carbons, non is nine carbons, dec is 10 carbons, Undec is 11 carbons and dodec is 12 carbons. And so later on, we're going to talk about alkanes, uh, excuse me, alkenes and alkynes. And so we're going to sandwich these prefixes together with suffixes to talk about which one of the molecules I'm referring to. Since we're talking about alkanes in this case, we're going to be talking about methane, ethane, propane, nonane, dodecane. But we could be later on talking about ethene, octene, or nonine, or undecine, so on and so forth, depending on the suffix. And or excuse, yes, depending on the suffix. So the the pattern of attaching a prefix to a suffix will be remain consistent throughout the entirety of both semesters of organic chemistry. So what you should be doing right now is taking these twelve prefixes and putting them to get in your memory because you will be responsible for memorizing these prefixes and ultimately how to use them. And so remember, we're talking about in each of these cases, the number of carbons. So these refer to the number of carbons and these are the prefixes that we'll use. And so all things being equal, if I were to say if 
I were to say butane, then I mean something that has four carbons in a chain and it has all single bonds. And so this is how we're going to build up this naming systematically. And so if I'm talking about CH4, then it's methane. If I'm talking about C2H6, then I'm talking about ethane. And structurally, remember, we're talking about CH3 connected to a CH3. When I'm talking about propane, I mean three carbons in a row. And the last time that I'll use a, any sort of condensed structure that involves letters, I mean something like this. But once we move beyond propane, we start to get into a little bit more complicated molecules. And so let's jump in and see what we're talking about. Let's go to butane and use that as an example. I can use butane four carbons in a row as an example, and this would specifically be called butane. With one car with if I were to number each carbon in the chain, I would get one, two, three, four carbons. So I would use the prefix but and the suffix ane because they're all connected with single bonds. But let's get to that first example that I showed you that has a lot of different, uh, another way to connect together four different carbons. Well, what about this? What's the name of this from a systematic perspective? Okay, so let's jump in. We're going to learn by example and we're going to build together a set of rules based on each subsequent, subsequent example. We'll go through butane, pentane, hexane. We might get up into hectane or octane before we start really digging into all the rules. Uh, we may not go through all of the different possible combinations, but my goal is to, to present enough different things to get a sense of what all the rules are. And so let's get to the first rule. The very first rule, the, the primary rule, is to count carbons. And not only are we counting carbons, but we're counting carbons in a row. What we're trying to do is we're trying to identify the longest chain of carbons. And I'm gonna switch to uh, red to show you that I can identify one, two, three carbons in a row. Now, in this particular example, if I switch to blue, I could identify one, two, three carbons in a row, or switching to green, I could identify one, two, three carbons in a row. At the end of the day, there will be some rules for determining which one of a, uh, ch which chain is gonna be the, the primary chain, depending on some other rules, some subsequent rules. But for now, what we're trying to do is identify the longest chain of carbons. And I'll go back and I'll use the three red carbons in a row to identify the chain. So now that I've identified the longest chain of carbons, this becomes the parent. This is the identity of the parent chain. So I know that this thing has four carbons, and before we would like to say four carbons is butane, but because I've identified the longest possible chain of carbons as being three in a row, not four in a row, this is going to be some type of propane. And so what we wanna do is we wanna identify which one of the propanes this is, and in fact, uh, there's not very many options for how many different types of propanes there are. I'll show you in a second. But at the end of the day, what we have to do now 
after we've counted all of the carbons that are in a row, what we want to do is identify substituents. So the second thing to do is identify, and this is a new word, substituents. on the parent chain. The word substituent is going to describe any carbon branching that happens along the parent chain. And if, you were, and if I were to go back, and I'm gonna get rid of butane so that I have some room to make the example, but if I were to go back and use a longer molecule as an example, we can see that the number of branching off of whatever the parent chain is could be uh, substantial. And so it gets pretty thick pretty quick. And so we want to make sure that we're identifying these substituents after we identify the parent chain. And we'll deal with them uh, as we get more complicated to examples like this in a second. But for right now, Let's just identify the one substituent that's on the three carbon chain. The only carbon that we haven't accounted for along the three carbon chain is that CH3 group that I put a square around. And so how do I identify substituents? Well, remember that we're talking about uh, carbon chains and no matter what we're talking about, whether it's a one, uh, single bonds, alkanes, double bonds, alkenes, or triple bonds, alkynes, the prefix is alk. And so when we talk about a substituent, what we're going to use is the word alkyl group. And so substituents are referred to as alkyl groups off the main chain. And so we're gonna use the word alkyl group and substituent essentially interchangeably. Sometimes one word is more, is more appropriate than the other. We'll see later on through practice and example, what, you know, when you might wanna pick them. But generally, they're the same, they're the, they mean the same thing. But the reason I bring in the word alkyl chain is because the number of carbons in the substituent, in the alkyl group, is going to become important. Because what I wanna do is I wanna name the alkyl group, again, based on the number of carbons. Throughout this whole naming process, we're using the number of carbons to identify to the reader what we're talking about. And so if I were to go back to this example with the blue, with the box in blue, the one carbon substituent, the one carbon alkyl group, and again, I'm using alkyl because in the next part, we're going to name it. This is a one carbon alkyl group. And the prefix that we use for one carbon is meth. And since it's an alkyl group off of a main chain, we'll call it a methyl substituent. And so I'm going to just change my accent just a little bit. And instead of saying methyl, I'm going to just say methyl. And so eventually we'll talk about methyl groups, ethyl groups, propyl groups, butyl groups, and so on and so forth. Uh, but right now, what we're doing is we're identifying methyl groups. Now, now that, now that we've identified this particular methyl group, the next thing that we want to do, and now what I want to do is I just want to shrink things down, move things over, have some room. We're still, we've done number one. We've counted the carbons in a row. We've done number two. We've identified substituents on the parent chain. And now, number three, we need to locate the substituents. On that chain. So 
So we've identified that we have a propane because of the three atoms in a row. We've identified that there's a methyl group attached to that three carbon chain. And now what we need to do is locate it. And how do we locate it? We locate it by numbering the main chain. Well, uh, eventually it's gonna, I'm gonna, in just a second, I'm gonna show you that it's important on how you number it, but in this case, it doesn't actually matter. Either way, I'm gonna get one, two, three carbons in a row. And so what I'm gonna say is that the methyl group is at the two position. And so what I do in order to name this particular molecule is put it all together and say that I have two methyl propane. And technically the two isn't required because there's only, uh, the only option for methyl propane is two. And the reason is the following. It's a common mistake for students to uh, examine a potential structure and think about structure A being different than structure B. But at the end of the day, they're not. And later on, what we're going to see is that the reason is, is that there actually is free rotation around any single bond. This free rotation actually allows this substituent to sort of move and rotate in any direction around that single bond. And that means that it could be pointing up, it could be pointing down, or it could be pointing in some direction that we can't illustrate easily on a two-dimensional representation like a whiteboard or a piece of paper. And so it's important for students to take a look at molecules and realize that some of them, while at immediate first glance, may look the same or may look different, they're actually the same. A, in this case, is the same as B. And ultimately, what you can always do is use the naming rules to name two different possible structures. And if you come up with the same name, then they really are the same molecule, even if you're struggling with seeing how, uh, how two structures can be manipulated in order to become the same thing. In this case, if I flip the molecule over along this axis and then flip the molecule again along that axis, I'll end up with the same structure. A can be converted into B in that fashion. And so uh, again, this is another thing that naming can do to help you see that two structures are actually the same. All right, and so at the end of the day, the molecule that I showed you was 2-methylpropane. And so that's the limitation or when it comes to four different carbons. But let's go ahead and shrink this all the way down. Let's erase it and let's get into a little bit more stickier business. One, two, three, four, five carbons. We're gonna see real quick, there's a lot of different ways to arrange five carbons. And so I, I can get back into uh, figuring this out. One, two, three, four, five. I've got five carbons in a row. There's no groups hanging off of it. And so this is pentane, okay, pentane. All right, but let's think about other ways that I could arrange five carbons. And so again, this is C5H12. And all of the different things that we're about to talk, that we're about to discuss will also be constitutional isomers of the molecular formula C5H12. 
So let's take this and let's shrink it into four carbon chain and let's pick, make one substituent here. But be careful. Remember that these two are actually the same molecule. This is the example that I just showed you. And let's name them both with rules and you'll see that we'll come up with the, the same name for each one. Okay, and so let's take a look. I've got one, two, three, I could go here, four, or I could go here, four, but in either case, I end up with four carbons in a row. Let's go with this one for now. On this one, let's do the same thing. One, two, three, let's go ahead and go up here and call that the fourth carbon. And I'll show you that not only uh, will I end up with the same name between the structures, I'll end up with the same name whether I go this way or I go this way. It's, it's equivalent. And so uh, we're gonna just find the longest chain of carbons and we're gonna number, or we're gonna identify them. And now what I wanna do is I wanna start numbering the chain based on the substituents. So I do have to identify the substituents, right? I've got one substituent on both groups and I need to number the chain. But in this case, it's not equivalent. I could number it one, two, three, four, or I could number it one, two, three, four, in the other direction. And if you remember, ultimately we're gonna have to locate the substituent. And so locating the substituent is actually important. And so if, if I choose one, the substituent is located at three, if I choose the other, the substituent is located at two. Those two, those things are not the same. And so ultimately, I think you'd see that only one of them can be the way that we go with. And so here's the rule. When we number the chain, we number the chain in the direction that gets to a substituent the fastest. And I'm gonna put fastest in quotation marks because what we really mean is with the lowest value of numbering. So that's the rule. We're gonna number the chain into the direction that gets us to a substituent first. It doesn't matter which direction it is, left, right, up, down, sideways, however it goes, the numbering of the, of the chain goes in according to when I land on a substituent the fastest. So if I go one, two, three, four on the top, I land at a, at a carbon that has a substituent by the time I've got to the third carbon. But if I number one, two, three, four, from right to left, I get to the substituent at the second carbon, and that's following the rules. And so now I have a particular way to number the chain. And so if I do that over here, then I get, then I get the numbers one, two, three, four for each, each of those carbons, rather than the other way around. And so now that we've identified the longest chain and we've numbered the chain, we've numbered the chain in the direction it gets us to a substituent the fastest, we want to identify the name of the substituent. And in both cases, I've circled them. They're both one carbon substituents. And so remember that a one carbon substituent is a methyl group. And now what I want to do is tell the reader where that methyl group is located and in both cases, they're located on the second carbon. Well, if, since I've numbered the longest chain, I know that, the that there's four carbons, so that, that prefix is but, and since it's all single bonds, it's butane. And so I just put everything together into butane. And so you see that I've got two methyl butane as the same name for both of these structures. In fact, they are the same molecule. Okay, 
So that's one option. So now I've, I've discussed actually two unique options for C5H12, but there is yet another option that I could choose. This molecule is also C5H12. And so I want to name this molecule. Let me clean it up a little bit because I was a little bit sloppy with my drawing. That's not helping. Let's try this. There we go. Here's a little bit better version of it. Okay, so let's go through the process. And I'm going to go a little bit faster this time since we've had just a little bit of practice. Let's number the chain. One, two, three. That's the longest chain. And I could do it either way. I could go one, two, three. I could go one, two, three. I could go one, two, three. Either way, the longest chain is three carbons. And uh, there will be another rule later on for if we end up with an equivalent, a, a longest chain, but the substituents are different. We'll deal with that in a second. But in all cases, it's equivalent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this as the, uh, the primary chain for simplicity's sake. So that means that I know that this is some type of propane. Uh, I don't have to think about left or right because in either case, I'm going to number the chain uh, in the way that gets us to a substituent the fastest. And the, in either case, it's going to be at the second position. So again, this is another point where it's equivalent. So just go either way that is convenient for you at the moment. So I do have some substituents at the two position. What are those substituents? Well, they are one carbon long. Again, there are two different substituents that are one carbon long. They are both methyl substituents. But again, how many of them are there? There's two. And so I want to go back. to the numbering that I used in general chemistry to name binary molecular compounds, like dinitrogen pentaoxide or something to that effect. We want to use the same prefixes to tell the reader, if I have substituents that are uh, identical along a main chain, I could have decided, well, we're going to say that it's 2-methyl-2-methylpropane, but we need to simplify it a little bit. And what we're going to say is instead, it's dimethyl. So that's telling the reader that I have two methyl groups. But in this case, it's, it's, there's not going to be another option, but in longer, more complicated chains, there will be options. So not only do I have to tell the reader how many methyl groups I have, I have to tell the reader where they are. And in this case, it's, I, would num I would use the location of each of the substituents in numerical order separated with commas. So this is two comma two and then a hyphen dimethyl. So putting it all together, I have two two dimethyl propane. That's the name of this molecule. It's also C5H12. There's three different options for how I could have C5H12, and they all have different names. And in fact, they actually have different parent names. One of them is just pentane, one of them is butane, and one of them ends up being a propane based on the longest carbon chain. All right. Let's continue to get a little bit more complicated. That was pentane C5H12. Let's talk about C6H14. And so the simplest way to do that, one, two, three, four, five, six, would be six carbons in a row. One, two, three, four, five, six.
And so I would simply call this with one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in a row. This is hexane. But let's take a look at there's you see when we went C5H12, there was only three different versions. And you can still see them in the corner. This version, this version, and this version. With hexane, there's going to be a few more. And so let's take a look. I could have this version. I could have this version. Remember that this is the same thing. All I've done is flipped it around. So that's not one of them. But I could have this one. I could have this one. Remember, these two are the same. So I'm not going to include this one as a separate entity. Uh, but I could also have, oh, I think I'm done. I think that's it. I think those are the only possibilities. So let's go with that. All right, so we've got hexane. Well, let's do this one now. Let's do, let's number this one. And so I wanna, I wanna go a little bit faster even so we can start to see the pattern. I'm gonna number it one, two, three, four, five. That's the way that gets us to the substituent the fastest. I'm gonna identify the substituent. It's a methyl group. It's at the two position. There was five carbons. So this is two methyl pentane. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. Let's take a look at that one. Let's number this one. One, two, three, four, five in a row. Left or right, it's equivalent, so it doesn't matter. I've got a methyl group. It's in the third position, so this is three methyl pentane. All right, let's try it again. Let's keep going with this one. One, two, three. I've got methyl groups there. Let's find the longest chain. The longest chain is uh, one, two, three, four. There's other ways to identify a four carbon chain. They're all going to be equivalent, so let's just stick with this one. I've got, so that's some type of butane, four carbons in a row. I've got one, two substituents. They're both methyl groups. Let's number it now. If I number this way, I get one, two, three, four. I get a substituent at two, at two to begin with. If I number it the other way, one, two, three, four. I also get a substituent at two. So it turns out it's actually equivalent. And so uh, I'm gonna go with it that way. So let's take a look. So I've got two methyl groups. So that's dimethyl. And they're at two and three respectively. So it's two, three dimethyl butane. That's the name of that structure. And then let's take a look at the final structure, this one. So let's number the chain. I'm going to number it here first, because that way I get to the substituent at number two rather than number four. It's still butane. It's still dimethyl because I have two of them. But now instead of being two, three, it's two, two dimethyl butane. And so for C6H14, when we get to hexane, or uh, uh, constitutional isomers of hexane, we've got one, two, three, two, three, four, five different versions. So we went from three to five. Okay, I want to continue to move along down the road. Let's go with heptane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's heptane. Seven carbons in a row. But let's let's start off with one, two, three, four, five, six. I could have that one. 
I could have this one. But remember, this one is the same as the one before it, and this one is the same as the first one. So that's not what I want to do. I want to go one, two, three, four, five. I can go six, seven. I could have that one. I could have six, seven. I could have that one. I could even have this one. That's a different one. Uh, let's see, I could have that one. Let's see, are there any other ones with five? I don't think so. Let's try four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's certainly a possibility. One, two, three, four. Let's try this. Five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What about this? Well, we're going to find out that this one is the same as, oh, one that I haven't used yet. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. That's the same as this one. That one. Oh, that one as up there. There it is. That one is already there. So this one, this one, and this one are all the same. You saw me actually hesitate for a second to think about whether or not it was something that I've already drawn. It's not going to be easy at first. You're going to need some practice in order to identify them. Remember, at the end of the day, if you come up with the same name, it is the same molecule. And so I don't actually need this one. I don't actually need this one because I've got them all laid out. And so let's, let's take a look and let's go pretty quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do these seven. So, so I'm up to eight total, including the straight chain heptane. And so I'm going to go quickly and number them. And I think at this point, you should know the rules. First, that, that's the way I'm going to number. One, two, three, four, five, six. So one is a hexane. It's got a methyl group. It's in the two position, so that's two methyl hexane. So what about two? It's still one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a hexane. But now I have a choice. One, two, three versus two, three, four. So I'm going to number it this way. And so I have the methyl group at the three position this time. This is a different molecule. What about three? Here I've got one, two, three, four, five carbons in a row. It starts at one, two, three here, or one, two there. I'll number it this way, two, three. So I've got two, three, and the two substituents are methyls. I've got two of them, dimethyl. Okay, let's take a look at four. What's number four? I've got one, two, three, four, five. A common mistake is that students will often say, well, this is a one, two, three, four carbon chain with three methyl groups hanging off of it. No, one of the methyl groups actually needs to be counted as part of the main chain. So it's actually a five carbon chain. It's also a pentane. It's still got two methyls, so it's still dimethyl pentane. And at this case, they're both at the two, two position. So I'll use that as the numbering. Now we get into something a little different. One, two, three. Now I have a choice. I could go four, five, or I could go four, five. Turns out it's equivalent. So I'm just going to go with that. I could number left to right. They're both, or right to left, they're equivalent. So one, two, three, four, five. This is also a pentane. But what is the group here? It's not a methyl group anymore. Now it's an ethyl group. 
it's an, it's got two carbons in it. And so instead of up to this point, we've only been talking about groups with one carbon, but this alkyl substituent has two carbons. So it's an ethyl group. So this is ethyl pentane and not some sort of methyl pentane, but I still need to locate it. It's three ethyl pentane. All right, uh, let's take a look at six. I've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. This is still a pentane. Again, it's equivalent numbering left to right. So it's one, two, three, four. So I have two, four, dimethyl pentane. And then finally, seven, I get one, two, three, four as the longest chain. So it's a butane. And I've got one, two, three methyl groups. And I could go one, two, three, or I could go one, two, three, four. Which one of those is correct? Well, this is a situation when the, the nomenclature rules become this is a situation when the nomenclature rules become a bit of a hierarchy. And so uh, the, the rule is to number in the direction that gets you to the, the substituent the fastest. And in this case, I have a tie. It's either direction, one, two, three, four from left to right, or one, two, three, four from right to left. In this case, I want to go to the next rule, though. If there's a tie, then I want to give the second substituent the lowest number. But either way, the second substituent would be one, two, three. I would be at two or three, or one, two, three in either case. So I keep going further down in this rule process. I want a number in the direction that not only gets us to the substituent the fastest, gives the second substituent the lowest number, but if all of those things are ties, then I want to pick the direction that gives all of the substituents the lowest possible combination of numbers. And so if I go from left to right, I get one, two, three, four. So I would end up with two, three, three trimethyl, or I could go one, two, three, four, and I end up with two, two, three trimethyl butane. And so that's the correct direction to do it. You're gonna see that there's gonna be lots of times when you have to pick the, which rule to use or apply them, actually what I mean to say, is apply them in a hierarchy. When, they, when I present to you rules in a hierarchy, that means each rule is less important than the preceding rule. The first rule that's most important is to pick the direction that gets you to the substituent the fastest. If that's a tie, then you can go to the next rule, which is pick the number the chain in the way that gets to the next uh, the next substituent the fastest. If that's a tie, then keep numbering down the chain, uh, it, it, then number the chain in the way that the total substituents have the lowest combination of numbers. In this case, I could have chose two, three, three trimethyl, but that was incorrect because of the third tier of, of rules. I wanted to try, I wanted to use two, two, three instead. And so what I wanna do is I wanna cut it off there I'm going to start over. I'm going to start another video and start to get into more complicated num naming. And we're going to add a couple of different rules. So I'll sign off there for now.